Okay. So we're going to dive right in here to John 15, which is still at the table, still at the Last Supper. And he says, I am the true vine. Now think of this. I'm the door, I'm the shepherd, I'm the bread, I'm the vine, you know, the vine. Everything grows out of the vine. The vine is the source of, of life for the, for the, uh, that produces the grapes. My father, he says, is the vine dresser. The Greek word is georgos, which means the farmer, the husbandman, the one that takes care of the vines. So the guy's got to plant the vines, he's got to cut the vines, he's got to trim them, he does all the stuff that he does. So the vines need work, I mean the branches, the vines need working on, see? The branches of the vine need working on in order for them to be able to bear fruit. So what does the vine dresser, the father, do? Well, he says, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes it away. So if there's going to be a branch, and that branch is not going to bear fruit, which in this case would be Judas, he cuts it off. Say, so why does he cut it off? Because the vine needs to bear fruit. Christ has fruit to bear in the world, and that is the salvation of souls. Then he says, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. The, the Greek word, as I pointed out earlier, is katharidze, which means to cleanse, to prune. And it's the same word as used back in 13, 7, and 8, where he said, you are clean, katharoi, but not all of you, see? So every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, so... He does that so that it may bear more fruit. There's a certain way that the vine dresser trims these branches. <clears throat> that if he keeps trimming off the <clears throat> extraneous stuff, they'll, they'll bear more fruit. They'll bear better clusters of grapes. Um, I don't have much experience with, with stuff like this, but roses, if you think about roses, if you know anything about roses, you know that if you trim your rose bushes right, and if you trim off the roses, they'll bear a lot more roses. So, <clears throat> similar idea here. So, he says to the apostles around the table, you all are already clean, or you sh in this context, you could translate it pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you. <clears throat> this lady is, you know, like many people that you will meet in your um, your preaching and teaching. She says, the sermons that you've been preaching over the month of January have really been affecting me, and I've really been re-examining my life and everything. Well, it's not me. It's just any anybody who really listens to the Word, they're going to be affected by it. And that Word of God is going to work on their soul. It's going to trim bad things off of their soul and it's going to reform their thinking and they're going to be able to, to be more productive in the kingdom because of that. So the word which God speaks trims the branches. It did, did so with the apostles that were willing to be trimmed and it trims the rough edges off of us. So one of the things that you know, you're, you're at school or you're in your study later studying or you're in your chair at home and you're reading your Bible or you're, you're thinking, if, if, you can, if you can learn to study where that you internalize everything, you think about everything, you reflect on everything, you say, how does this apply to me? What do I need to do? How does God want to change me through what I'm studying here? then you're allowing God to trim you, to prune you, to, to help you become more able to bear better fruit in the kingdom. Because we all need trimming. I certainly do, and you do. So he says to these guys, the, the 11 of them that remain around the table now that one has been cut off, <coughs> he says, remain in me. See, the... 
the thing that's got to be maintained is the connection to the vine. You've got to stay in the vine if you're going to bear fruit. You've got to preserve that relationship with the vine. Brother uh, Drew. <clears throat> Just to add, add to what you're saying about the roses in this illustration, it's the meristem on, on the plant, of the, the very tip. It's that new growth that produces blooms which turn into fruit once they're, once they're pollinated. The meristem is the only place that, that happens in most plants, especially the grapes. And the thing okay. is, if you leave old growth on a grape plant, the next season it will bear nothing. And there will be very few, maybe no, meristems. So it has, it has to be pruned. It's required. So see, you could preach a sermon on this. And you could get pictures of the vines and exactly what you're talking about and somebody clipping those off. And you could talk about how God's word, as we continually listen to it, goes all around the vine and it continu continually trims us so that we are optimal for bearing fruit in the kingdom. And you might even compare it to... It needs to cut a little bit of this off, and it needs to cut a little bit of that off, and even name those things that it cuts off. Maybe it needs to cut off a little selfishness here. Maybe it needs to cut off a little bit of pride there. Maybe it needs to cut off a little bit of resentment there and cut off a little of something else there. <clears throat> and then it makes us more able to bear fruit. See? Um, so... Abide in me, says he, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. That was true of the apostles. Their relationship with Christ was the most important thing they needed to maintain. It's also true of us. The most important thing for us is to maintain our own connection, our own relationship with Christ, the vine. And... Uh, so we have to abide in him. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, we can do things apart from Christ. But it won't be powerful. It won't be real. It won't be the real work of Christ. But if we're firmly connected to Christ and we allow him to work through us, then we can do real spiritual things that are powerful things, life-changing things, <clears throat> things that are real. So if anyone does not abide in me, like Judas, he is cast away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. <clears throat> yes. Real fast, now Judas is gone from this situation right now, correct? That's right. Okay. And if you go back to 13, 7, and 8, he said, you are clean or pruned, but not all of you. And he was speaking of the one that betrayed him. This was the branch that didn't bear fruit, that was cut off and cast away. <clears throat> said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. Now let me stop right here just as a practical application. Because I know we go fast and I know a lot of times it's blah, 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 you know. But let's talk about if my words abide in you. It's one thing to, <clears throat> to memorize some words. It's another thing to digest those words it's another thing to to feel the power of those words it's another thing to reflect humbly and honestly before those words and those words to become a part of us in a more meaningful way see so you will be a more powerful christian and a more powerful preacher if you will not just memorize words but digest those words and let those words live in you. Let those words change you. Because if the words can change you, 
then you can help communicate how those words can change somebody else. But it's more than just winning an argument or something like that. It's you letting the words become part of you, letting those words convict and convert and lead you to commitment. <clears throat> so I guess a, a, one way of saying that is if you um, are convicted by your own sermons before you preach them, they'll be much better and much more real and much more powerful. <clears throat> some, some of you, and this is, I'm not criticizing you, it's the same way for me. Um, you, you have a lot of sermons you do for assignments, I, and I get this. Um, we're trying to give you practice so you learn how to preach, but when you do a sermon just for an assignment and you really don't feel it and you really don't want to, you know, and it just comes out as words on paper that are loosely related to each other and I read them and I say, I am, whatever. <clears throat> but you, you, um, if you have a, have something in your heart that you have learned from scripture that's really made an impression on you and it's burning inside of you and you can tell me what it is you can say I have learned that and I really believe this and you give me a very concise statement what that great truth is that's your that's your thesis statement for a real sermon see that's where your that's where your real sermon arises from okay so you you make that statement that you have learned and you have been impressed with and you know it to be true and you're excited about it because it's life changing and you say, here it is. All right, then ask yourself, okay, what led me to that? How do I know that? What convicted me of that? Okay, <clears throat> then when you, when you go through that in your mind, well, this is what led me to that. This is what proved that to me. This is what showed that to me. Then you've got the points for your sermon. Then you've got how you can lead somebody else to that same conviction. So it becomes not just point one, two, three, or whatever on an outline, but it becomes something that was life-changing for me, and I think it can be life-changing for you. And this is how, and this is why. And you always think about the receiving end. <clears throat> you always think about um, how can I make this truth or this passage impact, be powerful on those people just like it's powerful on me. What can I do to achieve that effect? Okay? And I'm, I'm saying that for different reasons. One, because it's really true. But two... <clears throat> I feel like still some of you are struggling with the idea of, of what a thesis statement is. And that is that core truth in this that is so clear and powerful that this is the thing that he's trying to say. Boom, right here. Okay, how do you know that? What leads you to that? What proves that to you? What makes that powerful? Well, that's where you really get the sermon. <clears throat> Some of you still can't really boil it down and tell me, this is what I'm trying to say in this sermon. This is it right here. And if you can't do that, then you can't preach the sermon. Okay, so when you're actually preaching, I'm not talking about when you're turning in assignments, though it would be helpful. <clears throat> but when you're actually preaching a sermon, Preach things that have come to abide in you. Not just words on paper, but things that have come to abide in you. See? If my words abide in you, those are the things that you'll do well preaching. Does that make any kind of sense to you or not? Yes. That was a good apple. Do you just have like a fruit stand right up the street? 
Do what? So you just have like a little fruit stand right at the street? Just go get it? It's a little place called the Market. Midtown Market. You can go in there and get all kinds of stuff. Okay. So, <clears throat> again, he says, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done unto you. That's sort of like the other time he said, whatever you ask in my name, it will be done unto you. He's talking to these apostles about what they're going to do and how they're going to bear fruit. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. <clears throat> well, he, he's talking about the, the, the product of the life of these apostles. The example, the scriptures that they would leave, the people that would be saved, the word that would be confirmed, all of it, see. You're going to bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. <clears throat> um, we have no idea the far-reaching ramifications of our lives. And the, the more we serve the Lord, the more we're going to realize that we've had effects on people that, that go far out beyond us, and we don't even realize we've had those kinds of effects. Um, you, you'll be amazed at, at things like that. <clears throat> One thing that amazes me sometimes is kids that have grown up in our congregation that come back years later, they're married, they've got their own kids, and they it's, it's obvious that your ministry has had a profound effect on them, and they were just kids that were in the congregation. But they were listening, they were taking this in, they were watching. They were gleaning things that you didn't know they were gleaning. Well, the apostles, you know, you can just go way beyond that. So he says, uh, just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. Abide in my love. Look at how that's similar to verse 7. Abide in me. <clears throat> Let my words abide in you. Abide in my love. See, when you think about Christ and how Christ loves you, and you really own that, that makes you a different person as well. So he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. <clears throat> you know, God loves people. He loves even his enemies. He loves those enough to die for them that are even his enemies. But he really loves those who try to keep his commandments. And that's who we're supposed to be. That's who the apostles were supposed to be. I've spoken these things to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now see, this statement, if you look at the whole passage back to chapter 13, is sort of like, let not your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to send my helper to you. You're going to bear much fruit. Your ministry is so important. I'm telling you all of this. So instead of being troubled and afraid, you'll be full of joy, knowing that you're part of something great, see, part of something meaningful. Well, that's the idea. See, you, get, you take the whole thing as a package. <clears throat> this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. See, Christ had been loving them, serving them, caring for them, sacrificing for them. Now you do that for each other, just as I have loved you. The, the agape that we have in the New Testament is defined by that phrase, just as I have loved you. See? Greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for his friends. <clears throat> <clears throat> you are my friends if you do what I command you. So he's laying down his life. He's asking them to lay down their lives out of love the same way that he has. I know I'm going through this fast, but I'm trying to emphasize some high points 
that will be um, good for you long term. <clears throat> Since I no, no longer call you slaves, but the uh, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. See, Christ came from God and made known everything to his apostles. Then his apostles went out to the world and made known to the world what Christ had given them. You did not choose me. See, but we do. We do. We choose Jesus. We make him our Lord, our master, our king. We submit to him. We choose him. He said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Jesus said, you. I want you. You come here and follow me and you're going to be one of my disciples, one of my apostles. I chose you. Not only did I choose you, I appointed you, he says, so that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. See, we wouldn't have the Gospel of John. <clears throat> we wouldn't have the Gospel of Matthew. We wouldn't have the New Testament letters of Peter or John if Christ had not chosen them and, and anointed them and appointed them to do what they eventually would do. See, he repeats this thing that whatever you ask of me, and my Father in my name, he'll give you. Well, that's, you know, you're going to be out here and you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up, or in the name of Jesus Christ, heal a leper, or in the name of Jesus Christ, demon, go out, then God's going to do whatever you say for him to do. <clears throat> this I command you, that you love one another. And of course, in other passages, this command is given to all of us, not just to the apostles. But here he's talking to them. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. You see, this, this worries me sometimes about, about us, about myself, about others. If we're too well liked by everybody... Does that mean that we're compromising something? Does that mean that we're really not reflecting the teaching of Jesus? If we're not countercultural, then the world will love us. Jesus said, if you were of the world, like his brothers, like those Jews at the temple, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So in a way, if the world hates Christ, he'll hate those that truly follow Christ. At least in some respect. <clears throat> because we will make them choose this way or that way. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. Go back to uh, 13, um, 13, you call me teacher and master for you say rightly for so I am. <clears throat> A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, underline this, if they kept my word, they will keep your word. Also, so those that keep Jesus's word, keep the apostles' words, there's no different. You go back to 1320, where he says, whoever receives the one whom I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. <coughs> He says, but all these things, mainly persecution, they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know the one who sent me. <clears throat> if I had not come and spoken to them, 
they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. See, Jesus has come. Jesus had spoken. Uh, go back to John eight thirty one and verse 32. He's talking to people that wouldn't listen to his word. And he said to his disciples, if you abide in my word, then are you truly my disciples? And you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So Jesus did come and he did speak his father's word. And many rejected that word. He says, he who hates me hates my father also. If you love Jesus, you love the Father. If you hate Jesus, you hate the Father. Uh, what is it? Chapter 5, verse 23 says, All that honor the Son, honor, honor the Father also. And if you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father. <clears throat> if I had not done among them the works, see, in works equals signs, which no one else did, they would not have sinned. This is sort of like at the end of John 9 where he says, if you were really blind, then you would have an excuse. But now you claim that you can see and so your sin remains. So if they observed these works that showed the glory of God. And that's why their sin remains in rejecting Jesus. And of course, the reader, he's vicariously seen these works through the pages of the Gospel of John. And he's asking himself or herself, Am I going to reject Jesus, even though I've seen these things? <clears throat> but they have done this, he says, in order that the word may be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father... He will bear witness of me. Now see, in chapter 14, verse 26, you wrote down, He will teach you all things. He will remind you of everything that I said. Now in 1526, write down, He will bear witness of me. So the apostles were going to be witnesses. They were going to carry this testimony about Jesus out to the world. Are you raising up a hand, Aaron? Nope. Okay. I just can't see very well over there. <clears throat> okay. Ahem. <clears throat> 